Now I have the pleasure of introducing our next incredible speaker. Dr. Andrew Zilgit is an adult epileptologist at Beaumont and a member of the Foundation's Professional Advisory Committee. This session is generously sponsored by Beaumont Neurosciences and is entitled Causes of Epilepsy, How Etiology Influences Prognosis and Treatment. I know Dr. Zilgit has a lot of ground to cover, so I'll let him get started. Thank you so much. Uh, incredible is a nice word. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming out in the cold weather. Uh, Lansing who are tailgating, I feel for them. Um, <laughs> my sister. Um, and thank you, Epilepsy Foundation, for, for uh, putting up with me. And apparently, I've become a diva because I, I like to use my computer because all my slides are on there. Oh, oh, there we go. So we'll see if this works, and hopefully it does. If it doesn't, then uh, I can ramble for hours as is. So, um, oh, all right. <clears throat> so, again, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Epilepsy Foundation and, and Schoolcraft, for dealing with me. Um, so I, uh, this is a big topic, and when I started to, I, I listened to the Learn and Share so thank you, Russ, for pointing that out and everybody who needs to know about all the educational things that the Epilepsy Foundation does. Um, they have a learn and share. I think it's the first Wednesday of every, every month um, where they talk about specific topics related to seizures and epilepsy. And uh, this was a topic that was, uh, that was discussed, I think, in May. I'm going to try to follow what they did. But the way I, uh, first, sorry, a couple disclosures, I sit on the board for American Clinical Meg Society. I probably won't talk a whole lot about MEG, but obligatory, I think I probably will. And I also received some uh, honorarium for drug companies that are, are here today. Everything I talk about, I'll, I'll stay on uh, FDA label, though. So another disclosure is I'm not Dan Arndt, so you might be wondering where the heck Dan Arndt is. Uh, he had a prior engagement, so I get to, do, get to do all of this, and that might actually be the most flattering photo I can find of myself. So. Uh, get to put up with me. And I hope you don't look like this at the end of the, the talk. I hope there's, there's some clarity. So this, 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 is our, this is our program at, at Beaumont. And I'm going to highlight a point that was brought up by Stacia and I, I think is, is really, really important. You know, there'll be a slide on this. If you look along that line, there's a bunch of epilepsy centers here. And the state of Michigan is, is, is certainly um, uh, has a great resources for both neurology and for, for epilepsy. And this is our group, and since I'm an adult neurologist, I had to lean on, on the pediatric people for some of the things about etiology, specifically in regards to genetics, which is a, which is a, a, a field I think that is, uh, is, is blossoming before our eyes. So I'm going to approach this like you're in office with me, because uh, this is what we go over every time you're in office. We talk about your diagnosis, what are your treatment options, and what does that mean? And so the only way I could make this more realistic is if I was an hour and a half late, and you were, you were sitting there wondering, when is he going to get in the room? And then I come in, and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. So I'm not going to do that today. Uh, but this is going to be like you're in clinic with me, and maybe there's some people in the room who knows that that is exactly what it's like. So I'm going to use cases, though, that I've been affiliated with in some capacity to outline kind of how challenging this can be with, you know, the diagnosis, not even just getting the diagnosis right, but how that affects etiology and, and your prognosis. But I'm going to talk about some general concepts, too, along the way. So people who have been in clinic with me, this, these are my terrible drawings. But these are the things I kind of outline and uh, try to talk about what a seizure is. What is epilepsy? What's the difference between focal and generalized epilepsy? Why is that important? Then what testing involved? And, I tell medical students and residents and even, even people I see that it's really easy to be an epileptologist. There's like five letters you need to remember, EEG and MRI, right? Everybody gets those tests done. And then we talk about treatments. And then what to expect? That's the prognosis part. That's complicated. And it's complicated because epilepsy is complicated. I think everyone in this room could tell their story and it would be different. And so. That's because the fundamental mechanisms of epilepsy is complex. It's this interaction between genetics, neurodevelopment, environmental factors. I'll point, 
And one of my favorite studies, I'll point that out here in a little bit, about how environment can uh, impact epilepsy. And so treatment, we often begin with medications. That's not the case all the time. We often begin with medications. So when we look at treatment, we're talking about how etiology affects treatment and prognosis. Almost regardless of what your etiology is, the majority of people are going to start with medications uh, to begin with. But then it becomes really difficult to define that because everyone's different. So if we look at the International League Against Epilepsy classification, this is going to be our framework for how we move through the rest of the time. And I meant to have my timer on, so when somebody can let me know when I've started to ramble too much and move on. Thank you, Russ. Okay. So, um, so seizure types. There are three seizure types. There's focal seizures, which means seizures start in a focus in the brain and then spread. There's generalized seizure types in which the, the both sides of the brain are involved almost simultaneously. And then there's the type of seizures we don't know, the unknown. That translates into four epilepsy types. Focal, generalized, the combined focal and generalized, and then unknown, we just don't know the cause. Oops, excuse me. And what we try to do is put this into an epilepsy syndrome. The reason why we try to put this into an epilepsy syndrome is that dictates our treatment, that dictates our prognosis. So we can say these medications might work best for the type of epilepsy you have, or in certain situations in mesial temporal uh, lobe epilepsy where there's mesial temporal sclerosis or there's some scarring in the middle part of the temporal lobe, we know that medications might not be the best treatment and surgery is the best option. We try to put that into to, um, a syndrome so we can provide better treatment options and prognosis. But the etiology can vary significantly how we get to that syndrome. So there could be structural causes of epilepsy. That's where there's been damage to the brain in some capacity. There could be genetic causes where there's a gene change that causes seizures. Infectious process, like an infection in the brain, either meningitis or encephalitis. Metabolic causes, autoimmune or immune-mediated illnesses, and sometimes we just don't know. And all of that outlines our seizures and epilepsies. And if that doesn't seem uh, complicated enough, everyone in this room probably can talk about other things they're experiencing with epilepsy. Maybe they have autism. Maybe there's memory problems, which is very common. Migraine or a headaches. So there's a bunch of things that can lead into this. Depression uh, is, is something that's quite interesting. It's affiliation both with maybe causing epilepsy, but also being uh, what we call a comorbidity or something that happens in, in, in uh, combination with epilepsy. Regardless of what your etiology, the prognosis, or what we want your prognosis to be, always is no seizures, no side effects from treatment, whether that's medications, whether that's surgery. Those are our goals. So if you don't remember anything else, remember that that's, that's what our goal, regardless of your etiology, regardless of your prognosis, is no seizures, no side effects. And just to kind of give some broad overviews, Again, most people, we start, once we get the diagnosis, we start medications. And if medications don't work, we look to surgery. But there are certain types of epilepsies where there are more refined or defined treatments. And so if you have a genetic abnormality that affects a transporter called GLUT1, the ketogenic diet is actually preferred over medications. If you have childhood absence epilepsy, which is a specific type of epilepsy syndrome, a medication called ethosuximide, that's what ETS stands for, is the treatment of choice. If, unfortunately, someone starts to experience myoclonic seizures or brief twitches and jerks early in life and they, they're diagnosed with Dravet syndrome or severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy, we know there are medications to avoid. And then if you have a tumor, sometimes surgery is the option right, right from the get-go. On the market, there's probably 32 seizure medications. Um, there's even a new one now with Epidiolex that, that has, has come out, which is cannabidiol. We have to try to pick what is best for you based on your seizure types, your epilepsy syndrome, and, and what, would, what would be the, the, the best course of action. If you read old reports and you hear the stigma that comes out, and probably part of the stigma that comes from epilepsy, well, not part of it, is still <laughs> related to the Middle Ages, believe it or not, but also this idea that the prognosis is dim, that people don't do well. But thank goodness for Mayo Clinic, they have longitudinal data that they filed for years. Now, this might be an older study. 1979 doesn't feel really probably all that long ago, to be quite honest. But 70% of people are in terminal remission at 20-year follow-up. 
And why I think that's an important number to remember, 70%, is because about a third of people, regardless of etiology, regardless of, of cause, will continue to have seizures despite medication trials. So other treatment options are important. That number, 70%, is identical to what was reported in the 1880s by a neurologist uh, named William Gowers. So that's a depressing stat, right? There's been no change in, in outcomes since the 1880s, but I think we're doing a better job of, of of articulating options that might be good for, for some people with, with epilepsy. And I think it's safe to overall say that prognosis is going to be good. If you don't say prognosis is going to be good, that's, that's, not, what you, that's not what we're here for. We're here to make sure that you do well. So this is, this is a study. This is going to be a very busy slide. But this is a study that looked at somebody who was newly diagnosed with epilepsy, started on medications, and what happened. So you get the diagnosis of epilepsy, you're started on a medication. Regardless of the medication, 37% were seizure-free within six months. That's a great number. Within about a year, a little over a year, another 22% become seizure-free. And they have sustained seizure freedom, whether it's the early seizure freedom within six months or within that year for up to five years out. Unfortunately, there's about 16% of people who have a relapsing remitting course. This becomes very, very challenging to treat. They might go 30 months with no seizures. They might even go another 30 months with no seizures, but they continue to have seizures. And remember, our goal is no seizures and no side effects. And then unfortunately, there's about a quarter of people who never become seizure-free with medications. And to give you a real-life example of what this is like, so this is a person was born, they had their vaccines, and shortly after a vaccine, they developed a rash. And then a, well, a while later, they had maybe their first febrile seizure. Now, there's probably something we could talk about with genetics in this case. And certainly, febrile seizures tend to have a genetic course or genetic pro, um, predisposition. But this is an interesting phenomenon that I want to, to, harp, or, you know, to, to hone in on just for a second because I think uh, Russ talked about this with Dr. Vunka and the, uh, the Learn and Share earlier this year is that oftentimes when people develop epilepsy there's something that happens early then there's a latent period and what the latent period means there's nothing happens and things happen but nothing happens in regard to, to seizures but during that time the brain is undergoing changes that are are very important to the development or the predisposition to experience unprovoked seizures so at the age of seven or eight years old this this young person starts to say to her parents I'm having this olfactory sensation. That's a smelling sensation. It smells like ammonia or some sort of cleaner. And then there's an intense feeling of deja vu. And then, like, she's dropping. She's standing still but dropping. And so the youngest of six kids, this is going to resonate pretty well with, I think, some other stories that we already heard this morning, went to see her family physician who said, you're the youngest kid. You're trying to get attention. Right? So, so no seizures. This is a good case because, or so, so seizures continue. Till the age of 12, and this is going to come up, I think, in the next talk, she started using marijuana. And from 12 to 16, no seizures during that time. Unfortunately, she, she had an unplanned pregnancy, had a seizure, and then things just weren't the same after that. Multiple medication trials, and elected to have surgery, did well for a year, but surgery, seizures came back then started to have seizures more frequently, and then eventually was tried on a medication called Onfi or Clobazam, and has done well to the point that, they, that this person feels comfortable with the seizure control. Again, seeing, seeing me, I say, oh, we can do that, right? But this is, this is hard to predict. If you saw this person at the age of three with a febrile seizure, you'd say, the counsel say, well, you know, less than 5% go on to have it, or less than 10% have another seizure, and less than 5% go on to develop epilepsy. But here we are with, with this case. And then you would say, well, you know, seizure-free for a while, you might not have another, another seizure. And then here we are after surgery, seizures recurred. And I bring that case up because it's also important to understand that the specific epilepsy syndrome doesn't always follow the, the rules, right? So um, not every epilepsy syndrome has a less favorable prognosis. And your prognosis is independent, really, on the diagnosis that we give you. What I mean by that is you can take two cases, 
This is somebody with right mesial temp. These are two people with right mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. So where that, that green circle is, that scarring in the middle part of the temporal lobe, that's an injury to, the, to that area. That could happen for a number of reasons. For this person, they've been seizure-free on levetiracetam or Keppra since 2001. Unfortunately for this person, they continue to have seizures. They're on three medications. Same, different etiologies at the core, same end result, markedly different courses. And this was touched on right at the end, and this is actually an important point, I think. And I'm going to say this because it makes us sound even more important. Um, it takes a long time for people to get to, to epilepsy centers. And sometimes over 15 to 20 years. This is a video from Neuropace. I'm not going to show the video because I don't think I have permission, but I do have permission to take a screenshot. Sorry. Um, so, uh, so this is defining what an epileptologist is, and they ask the people in the video, how long did it take to get to see an epileptologist? 28 years, 4 to 5 years, 35 years, 8 years. And then they just talked about the benefits that they noticed from seeing an epileptologist. But it's not just those benefits that were proactive, were aggressive, answer all their questions, hour and a half late for your appointments. It's that when you see an epileptologist, there's actually data to suggest you do better. People have fewer seizures, you're more likely to become seizure free. And so if you're still having seizures and you're seeing your neurologist after the diagnosis, it's important to see an epileptologist. The Epilepsy Foundation is a resource for that. They can guide you to where you need to be and if you're in the Metro Detroit area, you're very lucky. There's two centers in Detroit. I think Henry Ford's here. Detroit Medical Center's another one. If you go north of the city, Royal Oak or Northwest, uh, St. John's Providence, all have epilepsy centers and epilepsy monitoring units. There's four here. You can travel down 94 to U of M, travel up 96 to, to Michigan State, keep going on 96 to Grand Rapids. You can see the Spectrum Health Center and also uh, St. Mary's. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm even leaving out of here uh, Kalamazoo and Bronson. They have an EMU and medical center. Excuse me. So there are plenty of neurologists and epileptologists here for you. So use that resource. That can influence your prognosis as much as almost as anything else. So going back to how does etiology affect your prognosis your, and treatment decisions. I've already talked about that a little bit. So I'm just going to use post-stroke seizures and post-stroke epilepsy kind of as a framework for how seizures start, how that etiology dictates our, our treatment options and our prognosis. So being an adult neurologist, people in their, their later years, 60s, 70s, and 80s, there's a higher risk for stroke. And people who have stroke can sometimes develop epilepsy. That would be a structural etiology. There's this distinction that happens, it's somewhat arbitrary, whether it's an early seizure or a late seizure. This is going to start to sound familiar. If you have a seizure in the setting of a stroke within seven days, it's thought to be kind of a provoked seizure. But if it starts to happen over two weeks or especially a month out, there's that latent period where epileptogenesis starts to occur. There's abnormalities that are forming within the brain that forms a seizure network. And so these early seizures are the consequence of just metabolic disturbances, while these late seizures are the acquired predisposition for, for, uh, for seizures uh, that are unprovoked and a diagnosis of epilepsy. If that sounds familiar, that's the, the natural history of what's called mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, or MTLE. Seizure early, a latent period, and then development of seizures later in life. It's the same pattern we see in people who don't do well after surgery. If you have seizures right after surgery, this doesn't happen for everybody. Um, epilepsy surgery is, is something that should be explored for people who have drug-resistant epilepsy. Um, but some people, when we have to do the surgery, they start to have seizures almost immediately after surgery. That's probably due to local disturbances, and we didn't really get the entire area producing seizures. But if seizures start to occur two to three years, four years, five years, six years later, that's likely due to what's called a secondary epileptogenesis, or another process, that latent period that starts to form seizures. Midlife depression has become a risk factor for the development of epilepsy later in life. And it's this idea that there's some inflammation that, ha that occurs, so we have something that happens, a latent period, and then the development of epilepsy. This is thought to also be maybe one of the mechanisms behind seizures associated with autistic spectrum disorder. Those are all physical things that happen to the brain 
but things in your life can sometimes impact your seizures. And this is, this is that study I was talking about a little earlier. It's one of my favorite studies. Small study, but it's out of Japan, pre and post earthquake and tsunami. So oftentimes when you talk to people, when their seizures start, they can recall when it happened because there's some sort of trauma or some sort of traumatic event in their life. And this looked at two, two 16 week periods in 2008 and 2011. So before and after the, the earthquake and tsunami. The only thing that had an increase in incidence to the emergency department for treatment were seizures and epilepsy. All the other neurologic conditions remained stable. So environmental factors sometimes can be a cause for seizures and epilepsy. All right, I'm gonna go very quickly through this because nobody wants a neuroscience lecture this early in the morning. So anyway, all right, so cells communicate. They do things, right? They send neurotransmitters and all of our medications are working on these areas trying to stop this, this cycle. And when these cells start to communicate with each other really, really quickly, these two cells here, they can start to form a network. So you had a seizure and now that latent period happens and these these neurons start to communicate with each other and they form a network. This is the network that we talk about when we talk about epilepsy. You'll hear everybody talk about epilepsy as a network disease, regardless of etiology. Whether it's genetic, it's structural, there's a network that forms, that communicates, that can produce seizures. And this is a busy slide, don't worry about what this is. The, the summary of this slide is, think of your EEG findings as being like a, a cigarette lighter, don't smoke, but a cigarette lighter. And so, that if you flick the cigarette lighter, you get a little flame. But if you hold it down, the flame persists. So when we're looking at an EEG, sometimes we look at those little flames that are coming up just from the flick of the lighter. But when the seizure happens, it's like we're holding, the brain's holding down on that, that lighter. And what that looks like, this is a study from Yale, <clears throat> is that if a seizure happens in a tiny area in the brain, just stays in that area, this is a temporal lobe seizure, you might not lose awareness, you might just have weird feelings of deja vu or sickness in your stomach or a metallic taste. But if it starts to spread, it starts to involve the entire temporal lobe. And now you start to lose awareness and you can see just the color, the color scheme on this, how different those two seizures are. And those are the networks. And why I'm bringing all of this up, focusing on that is, is that that etiology and that diagnosis is important to guiding the prognosis. These are generalized seizures which have a much different um, etiology. This is an fMRI study where we can actually see the brain is doing things long before we see the changes on the EEG. This is somebody with, with a type of epilepsy called absence epilepsy. They're treated with ethylosuximide, much different prognosis and, and treatment guidelines than somebody with medial temporal lobe epilepsy. And so you can see just in these two slides, this is the Meg slide, everybody can tease me later, um, that, uh, that the networks in generalized epilepsy are, are far more diffuse than maybe Focal epilepsy. So, getting back to what we want to talk about as far as what is it and then how does that drive our treatment and prognosis. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through this. This is going to just be fast because I want to get to a couple other, other points. But when you look at one of the first types of seizures you'll see maybe in early life, um, between the age of three to five months old, it's a febrile seizure. This is a very common type of seizure. There's different types. We can talk about this. You can read this on your own. Um, I can give you these slides, I'm more than happy to. You can use them for fire later or something, I don't know. Um, uh, but this is genetically predetermined, these febrile seizures. And it's important that this exists on a spectrum. You can have a mild mutation in a, in a gene. Where is it? Oh, I can't read that. Oh, halfway, okay, perfect. Oh, that's good, all right, thank you. All right, um, so it could be this mild mutation or it could be even a more severe mutation. And that severe mutation ends up being something along the lines of what we call Dravet syndrome, which is what certain medications have been studied really, really closely in. And everybody's very familiar with some of this, it's cannabidiol. So now epidiolics. <coughs> so Dravet syndrome is a, is a severe type of epilepsy due to a severe mutation and the same gene that could cause febrile seizures if that mutation was not as severe. And when you come to see somebody in the clinic who, a neurologist for sure, but an epileptologist, you know, we, we give you these staff, lots of people have seizures and, and a lot, lot of people have epilepsy. And it could be due sometimes to just metabolic causes, not real epilepsy. The reason I bring that up is sometimes that gets overlooked. Sometimes you go after your first seizure to an emergency department, you see an emergency physician, they get some lab work and they say, oh, it's because of this. They send you home. 
But the reality is, and we can talk about this happened for this person, and we followed them for, for a year and a half or two years, and they never had another seizure. So they had a seizure in the setting of some medications and metabolic disturbances. All their testing was normal, no risk factors, no need for medication or other treatments. But the reality is the first time they come see you is probably not the first time somebody had a seizure. We hear people talk about today so far that they are, they're sometimes scared to talk about this with other people or they don't bring it up to other people. So if you look at this, and this is a study out of, uh, out of uh, Australia. This is, this, these, are, these are people that I've seen. This is a guy in his 40s who for, for six months before he saw me was having weird sensations where he felt like he had to turn to the left but didn't. Um, or, and, and sometimes he'd feel weird in his stomach too instead. But he had his first seizure and when he went to the emergency room, they said, that's your first seizure. Your sodium's a little low or something, go home. His EEG and MRI were normal and he saw me. He said, I don't know if that was your first seizure. I, and I think we probably should consider some other, other treatments. But at that time, didn't want to. And then a second seizure a couple months later or a month later and now is, is seizure free since beginning in Kepra and he has a focal type of epilepsy. We've not been able to find the, the precise etiology of that, which is uh, something that happens I think fairly commonly and is frustrating for many people. We can look at this person, this is a teenager who had the index event in January of 2016. Saw by a couple neurologists. One said that they were having minor convulsions and had two subsequent episodes of, of convulsive activity, but was placed on two medications. Both were poorly tolerated and seizures continued. And so lucky for this person, within a couple months they were, they were in the epilepsy monitoring unit seeing an epileptologist. And within about five minutes of questioning, not trying to put down anybody, any other neurologist, but just we think about things maybe a little bit differently. For six years, they had been having seizures, little myoclonic seizures. And the diagnosis for this person is juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which is uh, thought to be probably a genetic cause of, of epilepsy. And usually responds pretty well to treatment. For a young woman with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, we have to consider the possibility of pregnancy. So we avoid medications like valproate and topiramate. And we start medications like lamotrigine or levetiracetam. And so transition this person to, leva, or to lamotrigine, that's LTG, and has been seizure-free. So the diagnosis is, is important, and, and that history is very important. And I just bring this up, and this is, again, I'm belaboring a point here, is that many people have had seizures before they come and see you. And that's an important prognosis, um, or important history to get, because it does affect prognosis. People with a higher, what we call pretreatment seizure burden, <coughs> excuse me, so before they begin medication, um, often have a more refractory course. Seizures become more challenging to control. This is, uh, this is my EPIC template. Uh, most residents tell me my EPIC template is not good, but anyway, this is what I like. This is our medical record. This is what I like to know when I, I see somebody because all of it affects our treatment decisions and prognosis. So when was your initial seizure? Was it really your initial seizure? When did you have your second seizure? Um, what happens during the seizure? And sometimes I, I get really detailed. Does this happen first or does this happen first? Because it helps with understanding what people are going through during their seizures. And I love this question, time of day for seizures. Remember what time of day you have seizures if you're keeping track of those. Certain types of epilepsies happen at particular times of day. It's very, very, um, it's not a general rule. It's not a 100% rule, but it, it does seem to follow a nice pattern. So people with generalized epilepsy, um, tend to have seizures early in the morning after awakening. We heard sleep deprivation is a, is, is, could uh, provoke seizures. And these people with generalized epilepsy, take juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, for example. A good night's sleep, um, no alcohol, uh, and limiting stress can have just almost as big of an impact on their seizures as, as the medications themselves. So knowing that those seizures are gonna happen early in the morning, sometimes we say, hey, Maybe you don't need classes early in the morning if they're in college. You may take afternoon classes, and everybody in college should not have Friday classes, right? So maybe, you know, just uh, take, take a break, right? Seizures that happen in the afternoon or early evening tend to come from the temporal lobes. So, and that helps us with prognosis because temporal lobe epilepsy, unfortunately, tends to be one of the more challenging epilepsies to control. Frontal lobe epilepsy 
seizures coming from the front part of the brain typically happen out of sleep or, or, um, or during sleep. And those are usually due to a different type of etiology, oftentimes due to a subtle change in brain structure called a malformation of cortical development. And then we always want to know risk factors. And if you notice, most of these risk factors really I point at my screen. You can't see what I'm pointing at. Um, anyway, most of, most of these risk factors actually are things that identify structural lesions. So when you look at central nervous system infections or CNS infections, one of the more common causes in the world is, is a phenomenon called neurosister psychosis, which is a, a tapeworm that uh, embeds in the brain and can cause seizures. But it's a structural abnormality that causes the seizures, not necessarily the infectious component itself. So we've talked about seizures and epilepsy just a little bit more. We always try to classify where we are and, and this, this dichotomy of either is it a focal onset or a generalized onset, and going back to these seizure types is important because if we can get these into a syndrome, as you've seen with some of these cases, we can really hone in on what treatment we use and what the prognosis is. And I just talked about these kind of in passing here, but here they are. Um, I should update this because 2012 is six years ago. But anyway, all of these things um, are... Uh, are things that we just talked about, high pretreatment seizure burden. So the first time you're in the, the office might not be the first time you're having seizures. Um, the physicians really have to remember that. Temporal lobe seizures, developmental delay, and then these things that we call malformations of cortical development or, or uh, disruption to the brain architecture. All right, so this is our photic stimulation for the day. So um, starting with testing and how does that guide our prognosis and, and help with etiology and treatment decisions. You'll hear from Dr. Barkley in just a little bit. He helped establish some of these guidelines. Again, EEG and MRI. Why are those important? Because if you have an EEG like this, this helps us tremendously start certain types of treatments. So this is a young, young, um, young person with uh, Down syndrome and what's called infantile spasms. These are a type of seizures that cause people to kind of jerk and bend over and, and maybe fall. And this EEG pattern is something when we see that, we can get to a syndrome that we know is called West syndrome, where there's this EEG phenomenon called hips arrhythmia. IS stands for infantile spasms, and there's some developmental regression. And the majority of these cases are often due to some sort of structural abnormality. This, oh, this right here is a pathology slide of a young person with, with uh, after uh, their brain was removed. And these little things here are tubers from tuberous sclerosis. If we can identify a tuberous sclerosis complex, not necessarily through surgery, there's clinical signs for that, and they have infantile spasms, we know a treatment called Vigabatrin or VGB is the treatment of choice. If we don't have an identifiable le uh, lesion, then corticosteroids or something called ACTH can be, can be an option. And sometimes these people go to surgery if they're, if they're continuing to have seizures despite, um, dis despite these medication trials. And then the ketogenic diet, something that... Um, is becoming increasingly popular and can be very, very helpful in controlling seizures. All of these are the treatment options for the, this, this type of epilepsy, and if you treat it early and aggressively, prognosis may be more favorable than it, it, if you delay treatment. If you see an EEG like this or like this, you guys aren't gonna see those, but we are. Um, you might see those too, we like to show them. But these all end up falling into what we call an electroclinical syndrome or a genetic generalized epilepsy where Treatment and prognosis are actually fairly well defined for the majority of people. So CAE stands for childhood absence epilepsy, JAE stands for, for juvenile absence epilepsy, and JME stands for juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. If you're diagnosed with these, it doesn't mean you're a child or you're juvenile because they can persist a little bit longer than that. It's just the, the age at which you were diagnosed. For childhood absence epilepsy, Ethosuximide is one of the only medications that we have a very nice randomized controlled trial to show that it is efficacious over other types of medications. <clears throat> the rest of them we kind of base on, it probably will work, which is maybe a little less reassuring if you hear me say that, but it, most of them will probably work. Um, and, and many of these people have great prognoses and we can tell them right from the beginning. If, some, if a young person is diagnosed with childhood absence epilepsy, somewhere between the ages of six to eight years old, they have the certain EEG findings, and we can characterize that epilepsy syndrome. Ethosuximide results in seizure freedom in, in the large percentage of, of people who, who have this. And many of them outgrow it. This is one of the epilepsies you, you can outgrow. If you're diagnosed with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, 
this tends to be a prognosis that is more lifelong or type of epilepsy that's more lifelong. If you do very, very well on medication, uh, one of these, the Valproate, Pyramate, Lamotrigine, Levotiracetam, Zanismide, Clobazin, you can go through and through and through all of them. Um, you do pretty well on those, but if you take the medications away, seizures are more likely to recur. So, so this is one that people maybe don't necessarily grow out of. And this is just kind of looking at this, DRE stands for drug-resistant epilepsy, that these genetic generalized epilepsies or what used to be called idiopathic generalized epilepsies, which are now maybe again called idiopathic generalized epilepsy, they tend to do pretty well. And this is a study that we had put together at uh, Henry Ford several years ago, um, not published in a journal, but presented at a couple confer conferences, um, looking at people that were initially thought to be refractory epilepsy, referred to an epilepsy center, diagnosed with a generalized epilepsy, and what did we find? Very similar findings to all other types of epilepsy. If you get seizure freedom early, within six months or a year, you're likely to stay seizure free at, at last follow-up, and last follow-up with this was 15 years out. The EEG might look very similar to those previous EEGs, but it's actually different, it's slower, and that helps guide us to a diagnosis or a syndrome that's called Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Lennox-Gastaut syndrome is a very common type of epilepsy that begins in childhood, but certainly persists into adulthood, and you can see that the etiology for this, 75% are structural meaning there's some sort of injury. And you can see an injury here in this MRI, this young person who was developing Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So with this type of epilepsy, the prognosis is less favorable. We end up having to try to use multiple medications, multiple treatment options. Um, we have 15 minutes left, oh boy, okay. Um, and there are well-defined medications that we can use for this, but always not, um, doesn't always maybe result in seizure freedom. This is a type of epilepsy, if we see this EEG, where people usually do better. This is something called epilepsy with central temporal spikes. Probably also a gen or genetically caused epilepsy because that EEG pattern can be seen in epilepsy with uh, central temporal spikes. It can be seen in an epilepsy called Landau-Kleffner syndrome. It can be seen in another type of epilepsy um, uh, called uh, electrical status epilepticus during, uh, during sleep. With this type, though, of pattern, many people outgrow the seizures. This is mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. I'm going to fly through some of this just because we've heard a little bit about this. This is the type of epilepsy that if we see some EEG patterns or some changes on MRI, they can do very, very well from surgery. Everybody should get an MRI. I'm going to show some pictures of MRI. And you should always remember that if your MRI comes back normal, to ask your physician to review it with you. And I'll show you why that is. This is a young, young guy that we saw in our clinic who MRI read as normal. And we looked at it and we said, I don't, I don't know. And it's early, but if you eat some mushrooms, maybe you can see the change. Um, and this, this area, this left side looks a little bit different in the frontal lobe. And when we brought him into the monitoring unit, sure enough, he's having left frontal lobe seizures. He's now become seizure-free on lecosamide, which is Vimpat. But this is a concerning problem because Lots of seizures early in life or before he, he got to see us. So that's, that's a risk factor for a complicated course. And these structural changes sometimes in the, in the frontal lobe can, can, be, can, um, can lead to a, a, a more challenging treatment course. And sometimes we need more advanced imaging to find the abnormalities. But this is something that I want to just jump to right now because this is mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. If you show your, or mesial temporal sclerosis and somebody with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, if you get this test result, and that's, that's what this MRI is showing, epilepsy surgery may be an option for you. And epilepsy surgery may be an option for this person. Actually, it was an option for this person who has a different type of abnormality called focal cortical dysplasia. So I'm going to just fast forward here to a couple other tests that are important. This is a person who had an abrupt onset of epilepsy and then ended up having an infectious cause called herpes encephalitis which is, is, uh, has a, this predilection to damage the middle parts of the brain. So this is also a type of mesial temporal sclerosis, but due to a completely different, different etiology. <clears throat> and then sometimes people can have, and this is through the ILAE classification, just be quick here, this, this uh, young person ended up having an autoimmune encephalitis, which is autoimmune means the body's attacking itself and had that not been identified early, 
treatment uh, becomes very, very challenging and prognosis becomes very, very poor. And fortunately for this person, we identified it early. Uh, she received immunotherapy, discharged home, and is continuing to work and is gainfully employed. So autoimmune encephalitis, and just like this next cause, um, is something that is, I think, becoming increasingly recognized. And it's in young people, sometimes with uh, predilection for, for young females, who some have these just general like flu-like symptoms and then develop behavioral changes, then seizures. Follows that pattern, and if you see that pattern, it's important to identify or to let your, your physician know so that we can get the right diagnosis. Just to fly through genetics just for a second, this is something I'm becoming more and more uh, involved in because I have uh, people who do a lot of genetic testing at, at, at Beaumont and it's, it's very nice to, to ask them. Genetics and epilepsy is, is complex. You have disease susceptibility and you can even have uh, response to medication susceptibility. And it's not a one-to-one -one inheritance pattern. Sometimes it's just de novo, meaning it just happens out of the blue. And it can be very difficult to predict. So this is a family tree of somebody that I've seen. Where the arrow is is the person I saw. His identical twin did not have epilepsy, but his brother did. And then his half-brother did. And going all the way back, his grandmother had spastic, or his great-grandmother had spastic episodes that nobody talked about. So we're able to try, to try to get this lineage. And so we see that people with epilepsy tend to have a family history of epilepsy. And that can help guide uh, prognosis and diagnosis as well. And just to show you that g genes and epilepsy are becoming more and more important in our diagnosis. In 75, we thought most of this was idiopathic. And now in 2014, we think it's mostly genetic. And the big gene development is this one right here, SCN1A. That's the gene that we test for Dravet syndrome and sometimes febrile seizures. I think I'm running out of time. So have seen some of these slides and we've gone over some of these conditions. Just know that genetics play a role in, in diagnosis, they play a role in your treatment options and prognosis. And what I mean by treatment options, certain medications you don't want to use. Okay, so what do we do? You've heard about all of this in the first talk. We do treat, we, we start medications, or if it's a specific type of epilepsy, we start other, other treatments. And if that doesn't work, we look into surgery. This is somebody who underwent surgery and it's past breakfast time, so now I can show gross brain pictures, right? So, <clears throat> but the other thing that we always keep in mind is, is that depression is very common in people with epilepsy. Headaches is very com are very common. Memory problems, very, very common. Bone health is something we always have to consider. Sleep dysfunction, either insomnia or hypersomnolence, so you sleep too much. And then women with, uh, who are pregnant, with, or women with epilepsy who are pregnant, pose several, several things that we have to keep in mind. And there's no one drug or handful of drugs that stand out to help with treatment. There are about five clinical trials that help guide us with this. There are some guidelines for this, and medications that are chosen are usually chosen with you to say this is their side effects, this is how they work, this is why we think they might be beneficial. Because I think I'm running out of time, I want question, to be able for questions. Just keep in mind that whenever we choose a medication, it's what we think is best suited for you and uh, the type of epilepsy you have. But keep in mind, this was brought up earlier, that medications fail. If the first medication doesn't work, the second medication becomes increasingly less likely to work, the third medication even increasingly less, less likely. And by the fifth or sixth or seventh medication you've tried, the likelihood of being seizure-free from medications alone is almost 0%. Not 0%, but almost. And that data has been unchanged since the 1880s. So I'm close to out of time. and I'm Sorry, I got about 15 minutes. Um, so I just want to hit on a couple high points, and I, I do apologize about this. I'm just going to fast forward. Um, that there are, are treatment options and surgery options. And one last thing to keep in mind is even people who undergo surgery, this is a person who, who uh, went through a lot. And you can just see this is their, their, their history. And they eventually got to see an epileptologist, and we said, we think you need epilepsy surgery. And this person went through, <laughs> yeah, blazing through um, the epilepsy surgical evaluation and eventually had a device implanted called Neuropace. And you look at a couple time points. Here is where we turned it on to detect things. And then this time point and this time point. These are two, two periods of stress in this person's life. This right here is when their, their uh, child was born. This is where they're buying a house. That's the most stressful thing I've ever gone through. But you can see now that we have 
medications correct and we've dialed in the detection and treatment, their seizures, at least what we're detecting right now, are markedly improved. So this is a case where it just takes time, prognosis varied o over time. And I wanna bring up that drug-resistant epilepsy um, is, is something that is, is, is important to recognize. It's important to see a, uh, an epileptologist in those situations because treatment options might be different than what you've been kind of outlined. Remember, early treatment success is very important. If you're not seizure-free within the first year of trying medications, the likelihood of being seizure-free starts to decrease. That sounds dismal, but remember that many, many people do very well with medications and with our first treatment, whether that's medications or not. And that if you are doing well, we can still talk about coming off medications. It's not always the, uh, uh, something we can do. There are risks that we want to avoid, uh, or not, we can avoid these risks, but we want to, to try to mitigate to the best, of, the best we can. And we always wanna bring up that the worst thing, the worst progno prognostic event is, is dying from, from seizures and epilepsy. And sudden unexpected or unexplained death in epilepsy is very common. This is something that people with drug-resistant epilepsy, we have to, to educate you about, and this is why we continue to try medications and other treatment options. And really the big thing we have to do is get you seizure-free or at the very least get control of your generalized tonic-clonic seizures, so bilateral convulsive seizures, grand mal seizures. Because even though we know that um, epilepsy is neglected from a research and funding perspective, it's neglected in the community for being talked about, um, it has a stigma. When you see people, sometimes they underestimate the risk of, of what it means to have uncontrolled seizures. And if you look at SUDEP, sudden unexpected death uh, in epilepsy patients, compared to SIDS, it's actually higher. So what we try to, to educate people is we have to get control of your convulsive seizures regardless of what's going on. And that, that influences prognosis the most. Seizure freedom is our goal, but that one in 1,000 people with epilepsy, especially drug-resistant epilepsy in the adult population may suffer this. So regardless of etiology, regardless of, of, <clears throat> of epilepsy syndrome, treatments usually begin with medications and then we consider surgery and other types of options. Our goal is always no seizures and no side effects. So the classification is nice to have that way to classify seizures and epilepsy, but um, and some epilepsies may have a specific treatment and a well-defined prognosis, oops, excuse me, but they're markedly different from person to person and they can have markedly different courses. So everything from the physician you see to what you describe to the treatments that we determine, um, or sorry, to the, to the etiology define our treatment and what we think our prognosis, our prognosis will be. So that is a storm of information and that's probably very scary to hear all of that. But trust me, it starts to become clear as, as, as things go on and as we are able to really refine and, and help with uh, defining both etiology and then your treatment options and prognosis. So I think I'm running over. I apologize. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for being here. A request for a copy of your presentation? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, it, it was, I was finishing it in my car this morning. Sorry. <laughs> we, we can add that to our website if, yeah. if you're oh, willing yeah, to yeah, share. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Thank you. Good so morning. my son is four and a half years old. He's mm. had, he started with febrile seizures at six months old, and now we have generalized and um, partial and absent. Mm -hmm. He's on four, he's been on four different meds currently on two. The side effects are god awful. Mm -hmm. Like he's the sweetest kid in the world, but he when he's on these, he's he's like um, super ADHD, super OCD, super crazy. So with the what's the likelihood of him outgrowing this with three different types? So. Yeah, so so I probably would actually start asking you some more detailed questions about all of all of what he's been through. But seeing that there was a febrile seizure and then some of these other seizure types, I'd start to worry, or not worry. I'd start to wonder if he he falls in, onto a spectrum of a 
of maybe a combined type of epilepsy where there are focal and generalized seizures? And then could there be an underlying genetic cause? And if there is, um, is, is that something we could target with treatment? And if there's not an underlying genetic cause, if there's a structural change in the brain, and if there is, is that something that we could target with surgery? The, the MRIs, the CTs, and all but one EEG has come back perfect, but it continues to happen. Has he been in a monitoring unit? Okay. Yeah, it might be worthwhile getting getting more prolonged, what we call more prolonged monitoring to, to help define. That's why I was trying to show that those EEGs really do help define our diagnosis and, and then that can really guide our treatment and prognosis. Yeah, yeah, it's real time. Yeah, it'd be. There are ways we can make uh, sporadic seizures happen within a monitoring unit. Um, yeah. It, the epilepsy monitoring unit's a weird place. It's the only place in the hospital where we make people sicker for a period of time, right? We, we withdraw their medications. We wait for them to have seizures. It's not a fun experience, but it, it is really, really an important experience. Good morning. I think my daughter has um, Jevin syndrome. Mm -hmm. In in your in your experience, is that more of a genetic thing? Is it worth finding out? And um, is and I from what I'm understanding, it's not something that she should outgrow. She's on her third med. That she is, if she gets, she's on Depakote. So mm -hmm. as she gets older, it's not something she'll be able to stay on when she wants to start a family. So is that a surgery option or? Oh, great, great question. So to the, the first with uh, Givon syndrome, Givon syndrome is a is a type of generalized epilepsy. I know you've been over this, but um, <clears throat> that can respond very nicely to some medications, but can have a challenging course where seizures can continue. Oftentimes there, there can be genetic component to that, and I think it's worthwhile having the genetic testing done. It might help refine treatment to some extent. Um, you know, if someone's seizure-free on Depakote, if a woman's seizure-free on Depakote and she enters her child bearing ages, sometimes counseling to stay on that medication if they're seizure-free is, is more important than, than, um, than switching medications where you might have a, a more difficult course. Surgery typically is not, not an, an option for, for most generalized epilepsies. That's not always the case, but at least right now, we're not, we're not smart enough to know how to treat that surgically. Is there any uh, evidence or, or data for women that if they have um, hysterectomies, does that limit or diminish seizure activity if they decide to go that route? Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I'll say that, and let me preface it that way. Uh, no, there's not a lot of data to suggest, to suggest that women um, have, have unique challenges with, with their epilepsy because um, around, the, around their menstrual cycle, seizures may peak or become more, more prominent. That tends to be related maybe to estrogen peaks, and then as, as um, uh, progesterone elevates, the, the, it might be a, a, a transient improvement in seizures. But as removing uh, the hysterectomy, or, or having a hysterectomy, um, I don't know if that really has a, a favorable prognosis on seizures, and there's a lot of other health issues that come with, uh, with having that removed. Uh, that was a great talk, Dr. Zillet. Um, I'm Davia, a residency applicant. Oh. Okay. I have two oh. questions for you. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, in your case, one, you said on using marijuana when she was 16 years mm. old, the seizures were suppressed. Yeah. Right? Uh, so now it's le marijuana is legalized. So mm -hmm. what's your opinion on the recreational marijuana and then the medicinal marijuana? Uh, you're going, th that's a great lead in because um, the, next, the next talk is, is all about that. Um, I've jokingly told people if, if wearing a purple jumpsuit gets you seizure free, I'll buy 5,000 of them and wear them every day. So whatever it takes. Um, so from the standpoint of, I don't, you don't want to see me in a purple jumpsuit, hold your applause. Um, so uh, so I, I think it's a, a, very, a very reasonable uh, treatment option. For, uh, for people with epilepsy, especially those who aren't responding to medication. So it's a, all of us have stories where people have been started on medical marijuana and, and do beautifully and come off other medications and they do great. 
that might not be the case for everyone, but it certainly is something that should not be explored because of the stigma related to marijuana. So I, I think uh, medical marijuana now available as epidiolex is, is, a, is a viable treatment option should, should be used. And I think your second question might be a little bit more loaded, uh, recreational use. Um, uh, <laughs> January 1st, you can make that decision, I guess. Um, I, I will defer for that, if, if people with epilepsy are using marijuana, I usually tell, and, and many are, I usually say, you know what, if you use cannabidiol or something that has a high CBD component, that might be better for you. Question over here. Oh, oops, I'm, I'm sorry. One, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm one of your former patients. You did a great <laughs> job for me. Thank you. Oh, thank, uh, thank Bruce you. Bruce Carr. Yeah, I know. I, I planted you in here for that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, my younger son died of suicide six months ago. We donated his body to the University of Michigan for research and uh, education of future medical professionals. My question specifically is, uh, to what extent does that tie in with uh, uh, epilepsy or future epileptic, you say it. Uh, and he was not epileptic, he did not show any signs of depression. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I'm really sorry for your loss. Uh, that's, I'm very sorry. Um, suicide, it, it, uh, so depression is very common in people with epilepsy. 30 to 40 percent at least have depression uh, with, with epilepsy. The, the predisposition of having epilepsy and then, or sorry, depression and developing epilepsy later in life is, is being explored, but epidemiologic or population studies have suggested that midlife depression is, is a risk factor for epilepsy. That he didn't necessarily show any overt signs might not necessarily mean that, uh, that uh, seizures or epilepsy led to, to suicide. Unfortunately, though, that happens in people with epilepsy, and it's just as devastating, obviously, as, as, as SUDEP. Um, but in this, this situation, um, it wouldn't be clear to me that one would, would, would follow the other, other than that that's just a terrible thing to have happen. So before, before oh. we go to break, I have one last question for okay. you. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, we'll, we'll catch up. Is there any research? Uh, we've seen epidiolex mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and outcomes such as that from research recently. Is there any research going on today that you're aware of that excites you? Oh, yeah. Um, now you got another hour with uh, of hearing me ram. Uh, almost everything. Uh, th there are, <clears throat> and I, I, th I think U of M is involved in some of this research in what's called optogenetics, looking at how to turn cells on and off that might pr produce seizures. Um, there is amazing genetics work being done at at uh, I think at Beaumont at U of M, and and then there's there's diagnostic tools like magnetoencephalography that's really helping refine epilepsy surgeries and. And, and Henry Ford Hospital, you know, has that. And so I think every center is doing something research-wise that, that, that is exciting from neuroimaging aspects to treatment aspects. There's, a, there's some new uh, players on the market, too, with medications, and we always are excited about that. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a lot. I think the, the big thing is, is looking at network dynamics in is, is the, and, and the brain. That's the most exciting, exciting thing, I think, for me. Oh, okay, sorry. I'll, I'll unplug. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, maybe the connection between PTSD and epilepsy. Mm. Are you seeing more of that? I know for myself, I had epilepsy for 10 years, was seizure free for 10 years, and then had traumatic things happen, and then had a whole list of different kinds of seizures after that. Um, and so I was wondering if you see that as like a trigger. For you. Yeah, so that, that, that's a great question. So post-traumatic stress, um, Again, looking at trauma it, it, as, a, as, as a cause of seizures, I think, um, is, is, is always overlooked and underestimated. And then having to deal with what you're going through um, is something that, that might seem like it's under-addressed maybe at times. This is a, unfortunately a common story that, that people have epilepsy, they experience terrible things, and then seizures get worse or change. And, um, and when that happens, it just helps, well, not helps us, but helps us redirect treatment. Um, and so sometimes in those situations, other types of therapies 
maybe even outside of medication can be just as beneficial for, for treating those types of seizures. Thank you.